We're going to take a look at the permanent portfolio and how it would have performed if we invested $1,000 a month for the last 35 years. But before we get into that, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here and cover some of the basics on the permanent portfolio, such as the concept behind it, the constituents and methodology behind those constituents or asset classes in the permanent portfolio. I also want to take a look at its performance compared to the S&P 500, its performance through the great financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, and also the performance of the permanent portfolio mutual fund because there's actually a permanent portfolio mutual fund uh, but the mutual fund itself is a little bit different than the portfolio concept still very similar but a little bit different and then I'll share my thoughts with you guys on the permanent portfolio, some variations to the permanent portfolio, things that I think could or should be done to improve on it. And then we will look at the numbers in the actual performance of investing $1,000 a month for the last 35 years into the permanent portfolio and probably some of the variations of the permanent portfolio. So here we go. Let's start by taking a look at how the permanent portfolio performed during the great financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. I didn't intend to start with this, but I think a lot of people are drawn to the permanent portfolio because of its minimal downside that it had during that time period. So here we can see the blue line being the permanent portfolio, the red line being the S&P 500. We can see a huge drawdown in the S&P 500 during this time period from January 2008 until December 2009, effectively January 1, 2010. The S&P 500 on a total return basis had a 48.47% drawdown. So let me just clear up the what is a total return basis. That just assumes that we are reinvesting all dividends and distributions, so dividends and capital gains, back into the portfolio here. Right, so had we invested $10,000 in the S&P 500, it would have drawn down 48.47% and then came up a little bit to have a drawdown of what was a drawdown here. A little over 20% during this time period. Permanent portfolio only had a drawdown of 13.52%. And over this two-year period, it had an annual growth rate of 3.91% versus the S&P 500s at negative 10.75%. So during this great financial crisis, you certainly look like a genius if you were in the permanent portfolio. So what is the permanent portfolio holding and why is it holding that? Well, first of all, I guess let me just share with you, the permanent portfolio was first proposed in the 1980s by a gentleman named Harry Brown. I do not know much about him. I am not personally affiliated with him. Uh, I have just studied his permanent portfolio. It was initially created or created, I don't know if you really create a portfolio, but uh, initially conceptualized in the 80s, he launched a mutual fund that holds something similar to the permanent portfolio. We'll take a look at that in a second, but not exactly the same, but still very similar to it. Uh, I think I alluded to that in the intro where I think I just basically said that same damn thing in the intro. So anyways, uh, and then in the 2000s, I think early 2000s, he published this book, Fail Safe Investing. I have not read the book, but he published the book. And that was when he kind of really put the permanent portfolio into the spotlight and put it out there. All right. So in this book, in his justification for the permanent portfolio, he proposes there are four economic climates. There's economic expansion, there is economic recession, and then there's inflation and deflation. All right, those are the four economic climates that we have, and there should be a asset class that performs well in each one of these economic climates. So for economic expansion, there is stocks. For economic recession, there is cash. For inflation, there is gold. For deflation, there is bonds. So the portfolio that he proposes uh, and ultimately calls a permanent portfolio, which we're looking at now, is comprised of 25% stocks, U.S. equities, 25% long-term treasuries or long-term bonds, 25% gold, and 25% cash. You might be going, this seems very similar to the all-weather portfolio. And it is pretty similar to the all-weather portfolio by Ray Dalio. I do have a video on that. I'll put a link to that in the description below. But the uh, all-weather portfolio, if I can remember it off the top of my head here, <laughs> let me try and do this. It is 30% long-term treasuries, 15% intermediate, or no, 40% long-term treasuries, 15% intermediate-term treasuries. So yeah, 55% in um, bonds, and then 30% 
in U.S. equities and then 7.5% gold, 7.5% commodities. And it has fundamentally very similar properties in the way it weathers financial crises like this. Okay, because stocks and bonds, generally speaking, have a very low to maybe even negative correlation. Correlation is measured over a time period, so you can find time periods where the correlation of stocks and bonds is positive. But I think over a long, long period of time, it generally kind of gets a little bit below zero. So correlation is measured on a basis of negative one to positive one. Uh, and below zero means a negative correlation. Primarily, they have a negative correlation, or at least treasuries. <laughs> Throwing a lot of terms around here, but treasuries are U.S. government bonds. So 10-year treasuries are generally, 10-year or long-term, are generally the, ba or generally basically, generally basically, are generally the kind of hedge against volatility or downside in the stock market. So both of these portfolios have a relatively high allocation to bonds. Hence, they do pretty well during these time periods. And then all, there's also the inflation issue. Gold does well in these time periods as well. Uh, and if you're in the permanent portfolio, it's cash. You're, you have a lot of cash. So cash doesn't do anything. So it doesn't go downside, go down. You don't have that downside. So um, yeah, through the 2008, 2009 recession, the permanent portfolio kind of did its job in protecting on the downside and you know performing well, I guess, in this economic climate, as Harry Brown would say. Let's just kind of open this up and look at this on a longer term basis. I said we we're going to look at this uh, in terms of a 35-year time horizon with $1,000 invested every month. But let's just go back to as far back as we can go. And I think that's a little bit more than 35 years. With the data that I have available, obviously with other data sets, you could go back much further. So yeah, so this goes back to 1978 to today, 1978 to today. So over this time period, we can see that the permanent portfolio returned 8.26% annually. $10,000 invested in the permanent portfolio on a total return basis, which means we're reinvesting all capital gains and dividends would have grown to $332,000 today. So this is quite some time. Uh, and $10,000 subsequently invested in the S&P 500 would have absolutely fucking smoked it. It would be worth $1.4 million today at an 11.85% annually. You know, and I always point this out when I'm doing these videos, look at how big of a difference what is essentially, what is that, 3.5% makes? 3.5% compounded annually makes a huge, huge, huge difference. So over a long period of time, the 100% equities as represented by the S&P 500 really outperforms the permanent portfolio, but it does so with a lot more downside. And we can see the standard deviation here uh, that's, effectively a volatility measure. Standard deviation of the permanent portfolio, 7.13% versus 15.03%. And in case I didn't mention it here, $10,000 in the permanent portfolio would be $332,000 today. Uh, and $10,000 in the S&P 500 would be $1.4 million today. Now, I mentioned that there was a permanent portfolio mutual fund. So let's take a look at that. Here we are at the mutual funds website, permanentportfoliofunds.com, and we can see the asset allocation of the permanent portfolio mutual fund. Tell me if you notice the differences between this asset allocation and the asset allocation of the conceptual permanent portfolio. We had 20% gold, 5% silver, 10% Swiss franc assets, 15% real estate and natural resource stocks, 15% aggressive growth stocks, and 35% dollar assets. I mean, it's kind of similar to the concept of the permanent portfolio, but there's certainly some little twists going on in here. Like, where are the bonds? The concept allocates 25% to bonds, but there are no bonds here. Um, it allocates 25% to cash, and here we've got 35% in cash. They're calling it dollar assets. I'm assuming that means cash equivalents like short-term treasuries. They just wanted to put a fancier word in here than saying short-term treasuries. Where did the Swiss franc assets come from? And then stocks. In the concept of the permanent portfolio, it allocates 25% to stocks. Permanent portfolio is really easy because it's 25% to everything. But anyways, here in the mutual fund, they're allocating 30% to stocks and they're not breaking this down or they're not just allocating to uh, US equities being the S&P 500, large cap, et cetera, you know, whatever interchangeable um, term we want to put in there. 
they're allocating to 15% aggressive growth and then 15% to natural resource stocks and real estate. And I have to say those are three very uncorrelated segments of the market. In my mind, as I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, I'm going through asset classes, but they're not all asset classes. Like aggressive growth, I guess, is an asset class. Real estate, that's an asset class. Natural resource stocks is not. It's not even a sector. It's more like a industry, right? But anyways, these are three very uncorrelated market segments. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Diversification and uncorrelation is generally a good thing, but still this is varying from the concept of 25% U.S. equities broad market. So yeah, there are some differences here clearly between this and the permanent portfolio concept, which we're looking into. Uh, what are the fees on this thing? Holy shit. Okay, no. Um, I saw this, I saw 5% come up here and I'm thinking to myself, 5% load, like holy shit, but then they've got class I uh, and then class A and I'm guessing... Class A is for very specific brokers or financial advisors, I guess would be more of the appropriate term. And then they charge a load fee on that. So they're probably giving the financial advisor some type of commission for putting them in there. And then at other brokers, you can probably get class I. Um, so assuming that you can avoid the financial advisor that's going to charge you the 5% that's going to offer you or put you into the class A shares of this mutual fund and, you know, force you to incur that 5% load fee, which quite frankly should be illegal you're going to be paying annual management fees of 0.81% or 81 basis points. I have to say, I think that is incredibly freaking high for just implementing what is effectively a very simple asset allocation here. Uh, personally, I would much rather implement this asset allocation through a brokerage like M1 Finance using their pies and using low cost ETFs. You can get this at a fraction of the cost. Uh, and well, you don't even have to do this asset allocation, you can follow the concept of the permanent portfolio asset allocation. So yeah, I will put a link to the M1 Finance Pi using the lowest cost ETFs that I can find for this portfolio below. Now, interestingly, this mutual fund has been around since 1982, more than 35 years. So we can put this on the chart here and take a look at it. And what is the ticker symbol? PRPFX, PRPFX. Um, all right, so I was using asset classes here to do this. What we can do is we can put this in as the benchmark, PRFPX as the benchmark. And then for portfolio two, we can do US large cap to represent, you know, as a use that as a proxy for the S&P 500. So let's put that in here. Uh, that would mean keep S&P 500 on this chart, S&P 500. And then we will set the timeline as far back as we can go all the way to today. And let's see what has happened. PR. So I got the ticker symbol on PFX. There we go. We can go back to January 1983. So we can see the chart right here. Red line S&P 500 blue line is actually the port permanent portfolio concept. The 25, 25, 25. Yellow line, the worst performer, is the permanent portfolio mutual fund. So again, these are all based on a $10,000 investment in a total return basis here. Uh, we can see that the permanent portfolio itself, and I'm going to call this the concept, returned 7.30% annually. $10,000 would have grown to $157,993. And the permanent portfolio mutual fund $10,000 would have only grown to $116,000, $480 at a 6.4% compound annual growth rate. So the permanent portfolio concept far outperformed the mutual fund for it. Why is that? And, you know, I think a lot of times fund managers go ahead and, or fund managers, financial advisors, publishers, whatever you want to call them, they publish a relatively simple portfolio and say, hey, this is the simple portfolio that we recommend, right? And then they need something to bring to market and they feel like they just can't bring that simple portfolio to market or maybe they want to charge higher fees and they need to do something to justify that. So then they start making little tweaks here and there and you end up with, you know, going from 25, 25, 25 to this portfolio that you have right here and then over time, it just doesn't perform as well. Or the other thing too is maybe 
uh, maybe this permanent portfolio did start out as 25, 25, 25, and then they've made tweaks along the way to try and make it better. Maybe they've changed the asset allocation a little bit when in reality you are, you are, and you being the fund manager is the worst enemy of the fund, right? And, you know, they're kind of um, succumbing to poor behavioral tendencies of humans, and that is changing things up and not following the system. And I can name countless fund advisor or countless financial advisors and managers and publishers and authors that have done this here, where they publish a strategy or they publish a paper based on academic research. Then they say, okay, I'm going to launch a fund that I'm going to use to bring this to market. And then they change some little things in the fund. And then suddenly it does very, very poorly. I'm not going to jump down the wormhole of who they are. Maybe I'll make a separate video on that, but there's four of them that come to my mind, you know, right now as I'm doing this, a little bit of research, I could probably find some more. Uh, yeah. So anyways, the concept of the permanent portfolio of itself outperforms the permanent portfolio mutual fund that was launched. And we can see even the drawdown is more in the permanent portfolio mutual fund, 19.13% versus 13.52%. Of course, I have to point out 100% equity allocation over this time absolutely smokes all of them with a $10,000 investment becoming $744,000 today. That is freaking huge. Now, uh, let's kind of spice things up here and put the all-weather portfolio on the chart. We talked about the all-weather portfolio a little bit. So we can load this in here as an asset allocation using, it should be in here, Ray Dalio's All Seasons. It's interchangeable, all weather and all seasons. The terminology is often interchanged. Uh, and there it is, 30% US stocks, 40% long treasuries, 7.5% gold, 15% intermediate term treasuries, 7.5% uh, commodities. This one has a very high allocation to bonds, 55%. So I don't think we're going to go be able to go back nearly as far. No. So this is 2007 to present. And we can see they've all done about the same, right? Redline S&P 500 here. That's our benchmark. But all of them have done damn near very similar. What is the green line? Green line is the permanent portfolio mutual fund. So that one has performed the worst out of all of them. Uh, blue line being the permanent portfolio and then yellow line being the all weather uh, with a total ending value uh, based on $10,000 total return, the all-weather portfolio would be at $28,058 permanent portfolio concept, $26,461. So not a huge, huge difference. The downside between them about the same. So basically, you know, I think we could fairly safely say that the all-weather portfolio and the permanent portfolio are both doing about the same things. So let me go to my notepad here to see what my next talking point is because I forgot about that. Uh, and I hope I didn't close the window out. We covered the mutual fund. I guess that, well, the next the next thing would be to compare the returns of $1,000 invested monthly uh, and then also share my thoughts and then get into some of the variations here. So I'm going to remove the mutual fund from this I think that is just nothing but a hindrance at this point. I'm also going to clear the all-weather portfolio since it doesn't go back far enough, right? All right so we're going to do that. It goes back to 1978. Didn't this thing go back further? And well, let's just set it back to let's just set it back to 35 years. What is this? About 44 years right here, but. 44 years is a really long time. Uh, let's just go to 35 years. Not that that is. Not that that is a, not a long time either, but I have to say at 32 years old, 35 years now, you know, in 35 years, I will be 67. It kind of doesn't seem that long anymore. Like, holy shit, time is flying. Uh, so 2022 minus 35, what is that going to be? 1987. I guess I just could have done that by saying my birth year plus three. We're going to set this back to 1987, three years before I was made. And here we go. So we also want to do, uh, we, this one we're going to do $1,000 invested monthly. So I'm going to contribute fixed amount, $1,000 
contribution frequency monthly, and we've also got the S&P 500 on it, all right? So how would it have done if we would have invested $1,000 in a monthly going back to 1987, started with 10,000, invested 1,000 monthly, the final balance of $10,000 plus the total of all of our investments would be $1,785,531. Compare that though to the S&P 500, uh, $10,000 invested initially, 1,000 monthly would be $4,097,835. I'm cutting off those thousands there. The compound annual growth rate is irrelevant uh, because this modeling tool is using the value of our investments in here in it to calculate this. So more accurate would be to look at the time weighted rate of return, 6.92% versus 10.84%. So the S&P 500 getting about 3% more annually and you can see the difference. 3% is just like fucking huge when it compounds out. Uh, of course, we can see the drawdown you know, being reflective of what we've already seen in the back test here. So what do I think about this? Um, well, you know, there's a few ways we can slice and dice it. First, I mean, I guess I'll start with who is the permanent portfolio for? And there's really two scenarios where I see it being applicable to investors. Number one, you are really afraid to invest. Like you're afraid to invest in stocks. You have a fear of investing in stocks and you have a fear of market declines in market crashes. Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, certainly one claim out there, right? The, the Great Recession or the Lost Decade, the Great Recession and the Lost Decade and the dot-com bubble, um, or I should say the Great Recession, the Great Recession, the Lost Decade. I still can't say this. Let me, let me get on the right page here. The Great Recession, the dot-com bubble, both being in the Lost Decade are, you know, right in our rear view mirror. So we do see them. So a lot of people have fear of economic recession. Uh, and if you're one of them, port permanent portfolio would be good for you. It would also be good if, you know, you wanted, if you're, you know, if you've got a short time horizon, you're closer to retirement age, or maybe you're saving for a large purchase in a few years, but you didn't want to have so much allocated to bonds. As of recording this in February, 2022, bonds have actually kind of been going down with stocks over the last few months. Uh, so, you know, if you don't want to have as much exposure to bonds and you want some diversification from the bonds and you have a short time horizon, the permanent portfolio might also be for you. I guess one of the things I'll point out here that I don't like so much about the permanent portfolio is that it has a relatively small allocation to the U.S. stock market or to stocks in general. Uh, it is in the permanent portfolio because it's you know, supposed to be the asset cl class that thrives during economic expan expansion, but it only represents 25% of the portfolio, whereas economic expansion as an economic climate is happening quite a bit. I believe that it is in seven out of 10 years, the S&P 500 is positive. So if we look at that and say 70% of the time we're in an economic expansion, well, we've got really, really limited exposure to it using this portfolio. Uh, you've also got 25% allocated to gold, which gold has kind of been one of those weird things. Sometimes it is a great infl inflation hedge. In other periods, it is not such a great inflation hedge. It is also not a value-producing asset. I personally like value-producing assets, like stocks. They produce value um, in terms of returning shareholder value, right? Like that is the that is their functioning objective. That is the objective of the CEO. Uh, and they, you know, return value by either increasing the value of the company or returning things, you know, through dividends, distributions, share buybacks, etc. So they're value producing assets. Bonds are also a value producing asset because they, you know, produce a coupon rate or they produce yield. Um, the, the coupon rate is the amount of interest that it pays that is different than the yield. Uh, that is something that is a whole nother different topic. But anyways, the bond makes payments is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, the bond produces value. Gold does not, so I really don't like that. But at the same time, gold has kind of held up as an inflation edge. Sometimes it does not always work, but here in 2022, we're seeing it still holds up pretty well. Cash doesn't get any return, but it also protects you from loss of capital. So I've covered, I think, you know, who I think the permanent portfolio is for really, and you know, really who it applies to. Uh, if you're in that camp of, you know, being afraid of investing in the market, Investing in the permanent portfolio and taking this, 
you know, a 6.92% annual return is better than zero. The worst thing you can do as an investor is simply not having any exposure to appreciating assets. Uh, and also for people with a short time horizon. Let me finally here, before we sign off, change this up here and propose a couple different variations to this portfolio. So first thing is adding small value. And I think that the same gentleman that created this permanent portfolio, Harry Brown, I think he called it the golden butterfly, right? So just sticking small value in here and then equal weighting them. And then you effectively get 20% in each asset class, uh, which is going to add up to 40% exposure to equities if we add small value in here. So let's just go ahead and do US small value. Now, why small value? Let's, let's just talk about why he would do small value in here. All right, before we do it. Uh, and that is because small cap value generally has the lowest correlation to large cap or the total stock market, uh, the S&P 500, of all the U.S. equity asset classes. So somewhere in here we should be able to find asset class correlations right here. So we can see that they're looking at IVV, the iShares S&P 500 ETF as the proxy. And then we can see the correlation, the lowest US-based asset class that it has correlation to is small cap. And I don't think, or yeah, what is this? iShares, there it is. Okay, that was international small cap. This is US small cap. Uh, we don't have small value on here, but if it were, it would be even lower correlated than small cap. So that is one variation that I like, and Harry Brown calls that the golden butterfly portfolio. The other variation that I personally like is going with an asset class that has even lower correlation than small value and gets you international exposure. That is emerging markets. We can see over this time period here, 2008 to 2022, emerging markets uh, are the lowest correlated equity asset class to the S&P 500. If small value were on here, I'm pretty sure that it is lower, has a lower correlation than small value. Um, you know, and I think that there's also wider valuation discrepancy uh, as identified by the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio between US stock market and emerging markets. Emerging markets have are about at about half of the CAPE ratio than the US stock market. So uh, I think that there's a lot of value in that. So let's just put that in here as well. We will put this in here. Oops, we're not doing 100, 100, 100. We are doing 20, 20, 20, 20. I need to add more and then put merging markets on here at 20%. We're going to rename these portfolio two becomes um, just call it PP with emerging. And then portfolio three in this case is going to become the golden butterfly. Okay. So we got all these. Let's just analyze portfolios. We'll go back as far as it can. That is January 1995. And look at them all here. I'm going to take it out of logarithmic so we can see which one has done the best. The golden butterfly with small value in here. Uh, that one did the best. $10,000 on a cumulative return basis from 1995 with $1,000 invested monthly. We're still doing that. Contribute a fixed amount of $1,000 monthly. Would have grown to $1,128,000. Okay. And then a close second would have been the permanent portfolio with emerging markets in there, growing to $1,045,000. And then finally, the permanent portfolio growing to $968,892. Now, notice the downside, the drawdown went up, and so did the standard deviation on all of these. Emerging markets is fundamentally the riskiest uh, that had standard deviation at 8.15% and a max drawdown at 20.42%, whereas small value did not have quite that drawdown or quite that standard deviation or standard deviation. Yeah, 
7.3 standard deviation versus 8.15 and um, you know, a 17% drawdown versus a 20% drawdown. So, you know, you could look at this and say, well, I guess golden butterfly is the right way to go because you get more return. Uh, you get more return and less drawdown than emerging markets in the portfolio. Yeah, that could be right. But personally, I, personally, I look at this and I say, okay, emerging markets has had a, you know, a really, really poor performance over the last 12 years going back to 2010. They're at much lower relative valuations than small value is. So I think that you might be better off to have that exposure in emerging markets. There's really no right answer. There's really no one that knows, you know, only the future knows. And well, we have to wait to get there and we can't go back. So, uh, you know, that is, you know, one, that's one way to look at it, I guess. Personally, if I were going to do this, uh, I would take the bet on emerging markets, but I am not a financial advisor and I'm not your financial advisor. That is just what suits my risk appetite and, um, you know, is what I would do based on my knowledge and insight. So please do your own due diligence before making any investment. Finally, 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 I think I already said finally, you know, the other thing that I want to point out is we could leverage this up. Okay, we could leverage this up using leveraged ETFs. Uh, There is a leveraged ETF for all of the asset classes in the permanent portfolio, a 2x, and I think there's a 3x gold now. The 3x gold closed, and I think somebody else reopened a 3x gold. So you could 3x them. You could 2x them. The only one that could not be done here would be this one because there's no small value uh, ETF. So let me just clear that. But there is an emerging market, both 2x and 3x. So, you know, let's just kind of take a look at what that would look like here. Not doing the contribution every month. We can leverage it. So we can double it. 100% Oops. leverage ratio. debt interest. We'll put it 2% here. Um, ETFs, levered ETFs do not have any interest that they pay, but they do reset daily, which that incorporates some decay because it's resetting daily. So you do kind of lose a little bit to that. I'm just going to use 2% to represent that. And here we go. We can see over this time period, uh, the annual growth rate obviously goes up from about 6.5%. It nearly doubles, but not quite doubles. So I said nearly doubles, right? $10,000 invested would have grown to, in the permanent portfolio, $213,000 versus $233,000 in emerging markets. And then also your downside doubles as well. So yeah, you can double leverage it. You could do this using ETFs. Uh, if you triple leverage it, Triple leverage. Well, triple leverage, you're just going to get 50% more than what we just got there. Uh, You see this. Now, the compound annual growth rate does not go up at quite the same pace. And did I do that right? Those things didn't look right. Leverage ratio, 200%. Yeah, okay. Everything went up. Um, Your compound annual growth rate, right? Because you've got that debt factor on there at 2%, it doesn't you know, it doesn't go up 50% reflective of it. It goes up a little bit less. You see the performance here. So leverage increases the volatility and it increases the downside. It also increases the upside. Uh, What I think is cool about this and why I like this is number one, because you're leveraging something that doesn't have much downside. I shouldn't say much downside potential. It does have downside potential, but it doesn't have, historically does not have, his historically has not had much downside potential. So you have these asset classes that you're rebalancing into uh, annually here with leverage and they're uncorrelated. So that kind of works things out pretty well and minimizes the downside as opposed to not having this, right? So I'm saying, you know, basically when it comes to leverage portfolio strategies, what you want to do is look for an asset allocation that doesn't have a lot of downside and has uncorrelated assets and then lever that up. This portfolio on a back test works for that. One of the kind of Achilles heels, or I shouldn't say Achilles heels, but one of the things with the all weather portfolio is a lot of people like to look into researching leveraging it, but for the asset classes that they have in there, and I think that is in namely commodities, you cannot there or you cannot there is not a levered commodity basket ETF so uh, it makes it a little tricky to implement that with leverage this portfolio here 
is easily implemented. These asset classes are easily implemented with leveraged ETFs, albeit the exception being cash, cash is cash. So yeah, uh, that is it here. That is all I have for you guys on the permanent portfolio. Hopefully you guys found it helpful and ex helpful and insightful and also exciteful. I don't know, does this stuff excite you? If you're still watching this video to this point, it probably does. Uh, it definitely excites me and keeps me interested. I love finance, I love quantitative investing here, and I love sharing this stuff with you guys. So on that note, if you guys have any questions, drop them in the comments below. If there's anything you feel like I missed and left out, also drop that in the comments below, guys. That is a wrap. I am signing off on this one. Oh, and before I sign off totally, I'm just gonna share with you, I will put links to all of these portfolios using M1 Finance Pies in the description below. So now I'm signing off on this one, guys. Have a good one.